the almighty has given you hands mind able body to work that's what he's already done for of you course. it is for you to use them meaningfully and make a life out of yourself going and asking for things uh, is is belittling his gift to you already so i mean we are fortunate we are able body to test which i call every day to, uh, i call it my pillow test okay every day I, when i lay my head on the pillow i consciously used to do it but now it happens subconsciously also i think of what i've done during the day anything that i believe i have done incorrectly or i have done something which is i have wronged somebody or i have uh, knowingly uh, let down somebody or i have uh, manipulated something to, which i feel if i have done if i i feel i have done i make it a point to make amends next day whether it means swallowing a bitter pill and telling the person that i'm sorry i made a mistake or you know withdrawing an offer where i think i am not doing justice to a client or i genuinely do that uh, they say that if it's not broke why fix it so i said we cannot follow that routine if it's not broke why fix it there is always a better way to do it so let's find that better way to do it uh, you know it might have succeeded 10 times and there's always a way to do it that it you know succeeds in a better way so my team used to say sir kyun kar rahe hain so i think if we don't do it people catch up and sometimes in between you become complacent and we became complacent oh, in yeah, between yeah, yeah. i mean right just can i say thank you so much for being on jantak show uh before we start i just want to like you know also get it out there that we have been chasing you since april and there's no way i could have let you go i have been following up with you regularly because i've not seen a person with so much diverse experiences doing a very unconventional thing a person with so many so much values and because i have spoken to you on the phone you seem very humble you have such a like you, you speak with so much humility there's no way i could have let you go so thank you so much for being on my stand an unconditional <laughs> apology for not being accessible because um maybe uh, when you say with so much diversity probably so disorganized would have been a better thing to say uh, i haven't been able to organize myself well enough to uh, be able to you know take out time as we had agreed on so many occasions but i'm so glad that we finally are sitting together and uh, i'm looking forward to uh, sharing my thoughts with you and understanding uh, about the current things that you know how these things work um so let's get started so we are looking forward to that as well and thank you so much for finding time for us uh but before we start i have a very interesting question so how does uh, just kirat singh nagra become vladimir just kirat singh nagra before we really get into the into the conversation i wanted to know i know because you just told me for the yeah. podcast but want to hear that for our audience oh well um my dad who was in the army uh, he uh, was posted in russia okay in soviet union as well uh, soviet union and uh, he was there uh, in 68 from 68 to 72 and i was born in moscow okay and uh, my parents uh, were very impressed by the soviet system in those days by what they saw uh, the way the country was organized way the people were and the love and affection of the people that they interacted with that uh, i believe my mom said that if i have a son i'll uh, name him vladimir uh that is vladimir ilich lenin's name okay and uh, not about not because of the fact that she was she was socialist in nature i think she just <laughs> fell in love with the uh, people of the of soviet union and that's how i got my name and obviously uh, as you would know that um, sikhs have a punjabi name also yes so uh, my my name that mother thought of giving me uh, was jaskirat so uh, not wanting to drop one over the other so it became vladimir jaskirat singh nagra and uh, it just about fits in the certificate my education certificate they didn't <laughs> have any more space so uh, yeah that's how i became vladimir yeah. when i was doing uh, like you, you know my research on you i also saw that it's your legal name as well yeah. so have, do you have any interesting story to share maybe someone asked you on the airport or like you know do you have any story to share with uh, i have a very good story <laughs> very very interesting story i mean i'll tell you this way okay fine maybe the way i look Okay. Um, especially after 2001, every foreign travel that I've undertaken has been an interesting one for me. You know, okay. I mean, uh, ranging from some very uncomfortable experiences where a little child turned back and looked at me and said, "Osama," 
Oh, Obama. Sorry. Obama. Which, uh, Osama, sorry. That and, uh, happened after 9-11. And, and, and that was very unnerving. I, I, but I, I, I was very, very uh, impressed that her mother was a French lady. Uh, she was well versed and well, you know, she had uh, probably had insight into Indian, uh, in Indian society. So she stopped the daughter and ex- introduced her to me and she said he's a Sikh from India and you know, try to make the child understand. That was one of the nasty experiences. But the most interesting one was uh, my recent visit to Ukraine. Okay. Uh, and uh, you have this Sadar gentleman with turban and a beard like mine walking to the customs guy and they pick up my passport and see Jaskirat Singh, Vladimir and he's looking up and down, you know, and this lady then she called all her associates and told them in Ukraine, Vladimir. <laughs> so, uh, they, were Im- they were quite amused by this. So, Obviously, uh, it happens quite often that my passport is then taken to the immigration check because, you know, it's very unusual to see a person of my, uh, um, you know, outlook, appearance. appearance and yes. uh, so, so they went and then the, the gentleman, the, cust- the immigration official said, is this your real name? So, yeah, it is my real name. It's on my passport. It's my real name. So, he said, could you please wait? So, I was walking to wait in the waiting lounge and one of the security border guards they have over there shouted out, Vladimir! So I turned back and I said, Da, because I had no bit of Russian. And there were about 12 of them standing there and all of them burst into laughter. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so that was very funny <laughs> for me that, you know, their way of ass- you know, the ascertaining whether they were verify whether that was a genuine <laughs> Vladimir or not was to cold shout my name and see wha- how I respond. Right. So that was amusing, yeah. But I've, I've had inst- issues and it's, uh, in sometimes it's amusing, sometimes it's uh, a bit uh, stressful. But yeah, it's, uh, Vladimir has, uh, and probably combined with my parents, has been quite an interesting thing for me while traveling, especially overseas. Absolutely. And uh, what you said, the first experience you had, I I know a lot of people had this similar experience after 9-11 yeah. and it, it's horrifying. It, it was uh, quite distressful. It was a, because I was in a very uh, small little uh, town in south of France and uh, I had absolutely, uh, I mean I had come in from UK at that time and I had, you know, UK fortunately is more cosmopolitan so there is no, no, not too much of uh, uh, difficulty uh, being in part of that society but uh, French by nature are a bit reserved and especially over there when you are, you know, suddenly you are you know, in a small French town, you're all alone. You're, uh, you know, you're not too many familiar faces yes, around you. And somebody yes. turns around and calls you the most wanted person in the world, and that to a child, it is a bit distressful, distressing. But it, I, I guess uh, those are difficult times, and you know, of everybody had his own experience. But yeah, that was one of the things which I probably will carry with me. Of course, again, I'm sorry that happened to you. Yeah. And uh, so we are talking about names, and again, I'm come. I'm going to come to another name that's associated with you which is Herblo Motors and uh, so I'm, ge- I'm going to make an assumption uh, here B- so I know Serblo is a metal that's used for Kada, yeah. Kirpan uh, it's also the metal that was used by Guru Gobind Singh Ji uh, for the Bata right yeah. so uh, w- what I get from this is that you're a man who is well connected with the roots well connected with the religion is that right well uh, I would say that um, in the conventional sense of uh, being very very spiritual and very religious probably I won't fit the bill because I'm not the one who you know uh, goes to Gurdwara seven days a week or once every seven days I do when I feel the need to go uh, but I'm very I'm a believer I believe that uh, something which is beyond our comprehension controls everything that happens around us Um, it is you know it's very easy to say that you know this is how destiny is supposed to be and this is how destiny yeah, I believe there is a, everything is destined to be, but you have a role to play in how the destiny plays out and that is governed by somebody that is beyond your comprehension. So, um, I am I am a believer, so I am spiritual, I believe um, I believe in the teachings of our Gurus, but I am also because my, the way we were brought up by my dad who being in the army and being in the Indian army, you are, you are absolutely the most secular form of Indian that you can yes, form because yes, yes. Uh, Till very very late in my life, I we never realized that you know there are differences in. Of course. So, so I believe uh, the route to spirituality doesn't only go through Sikhism. It could be through Christianity, through Muslims, and These through tools, Hinduism. Basically. It can go through anything. But I believe that the most important part of being spiritual is to try and be as honest and as 
as committed to what you do as you can be. Mm-hmm. And uh, so when I was thinking the name for my uh, company uh, or for the you know brand, Sarlu stuck to me because you know what it is the purest form of metal that was known at its time. I yes, mean, they have obviously. Yes. metallurgy is evolved but in those days serblo was one of the purest form of metals that's why the means serb means pure lo means metal so the words came together and they formed serblo and it was very strong metal it was used for weapons it was malleable at the same time you could draw it you could you know shape it into different forms so i tried to connect it that you know we will do whatever we do with honesty as far as we can uh, we will be pure and true to our cause so you know we try and bringing the best qualities the like alloy serblo brings in and we will be flexible to change with time you know malleable and take the shape of you know the needs that customers might have uh and honestly uh, even today when i think of i always tell my team and i always work to that we cannot let down the name serblo because it has so much going for it you know it's not only serblo motor the word serblo has so yeah, much definitely. of uh so much honesty and you know um, goodness that it carries that we just cannot let it down so we have to do everything with honesty and commitment that's the philosophy with which we work how far we succeed how far we can do uh, people are there to judge but we try and do that so uh, really beautiful answer thank you so much yeah. uh, so you said that you would not fit into the maybe like you know how people show the spiritual uh, spiritual person is yeah. but you are a spiritual I'm person so I'm what are the tools that you use for example some people use meditation some people uh, you know uh, l- listen to various preaching so what what are the tools that you use for uh, maybe you know discovering your spirituality or finding your spiritual meaning well um i'm still trying to discover that okay i mean i have not course, reached, i, I have not reached the stage where i can say that i found my way of uh connecting with the with his fire 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 but uh i do a very simple test which i call every day to, i call it my pillow test okay every day I, when i lay my head on the pillow i consciously used to do it but now it happens subconsciously also i think of what i have done during the day anything that i believe i have done incorrectly or i have done something which is i have wronged somebody or i have uh knowingly uh let down somebody or i've uh, manipulated something to, which i feel if i've done if i i feel i've done i make it a point to make amends next day whether it means swallowing a bitter pill and telling the person that i'm sorry i made a mistake or you know withdrawing an offer where i think i'm not doing justice to a client or i genuinely do that I get a lot of spiritual strength from my parents you know my parents both of them are immensely spiritual people i mean my mom i think i call her moving to uh, you know mo- mobile temple <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, very well read very articulate very well traveled very exposed lady but very spiritual at the same time she does her part in the morning she practices multiple uh, you know she does aarti kirtan part uh, she has a small uh, place in her uh, a uh, holy place where she has statues and murtis and uh, things of most religions so you know uh, i gain a lot of strength by what she does listening to them my grandfather both of them in fact my nana ji he had a great influence on us in terms of teaching us about spiritual aspects of life and i believe that i mean i think eventually i you know uh, following a regimented form of uh, practice is a good way of doing it but as long as you're doing your job with honesty and integrity and you're not you know you're not cheating people for the moment i think that's keeping me very calm and composed as i graduate in life uh, you know go forward probably uh, i keep increasing my uh, self awareness and you know involvement with meditation i have not been able to successfully meditate so far um, and that doubt that i have i mean I, i have not even tried i'll be very honest i go to gurudwaras uh, it's as a matter of fact if i'm traveling to a place and if there is a mandir or gurdwara i make it a point to visit that uh, because if it can bring peace to so many people who come there i'm sure there's something worth exploring and it genuinely brings me peace also i mean um, so yeah currently i think it's limited to uh, very little uh, actual physical meditation or spiritual acts but being uh, consciously uh, aware of that there is somebody watching you all the time yeah. you know just being aware of this fact that 
our whole life is constant journey of getting more self aware yeah. because you know this fact you are already more self aware than a lot of people well i guess so <laughs> i mean i i strongly believe you you can <coughs> I mean, I'm not defeated that you know. मेरी किस्मत में ही लिखा था. I don't believe that. You are a uh, sum of all the acts that you put, that you actions that you take place. And uh, you know, um, I had a worker with me who uh, was a Muslim, and he told me that his father taught him that whenever you go to the mosque, never go and ask for anything. He says, the Almighty has given you hands, mind, able body to work. that's he, what is already done for of you course. it is for you to use them meaningfully and make a life out of yourself going and asking for things uh, is is belittling his gift to you already so i mean we are fortunate we are able bodied we are given uh, ability to earn a living you know as long as we are doing it in an honest way with sincerity i'm sure he will watch out for us and you're right if you're self aware that you know you i mean i'm always aware that they, his presence is there he is there he is watching out for us and um, he, he watches your good and bad both and the uh, settlement of accounts happens in this life itself so so um, be good as you as, as good as you can yeah. so beautiful so i really liked how in one of the answers you sneaked in a word regimented yeah. because you you, are, you have an <laughs> background yeah uh, it must have happened subconsciously yeah. but that's not a word that i hear very often yeah i think uh, we have a lot of time with the army <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, so and, and uh, you know uh, as you said it's b- just because you had an army background uh, like you know there was a lot of you became very secular because you were yeah. exposed to people from uh, different races different ethnicities Absolutely. different parts of india different parts of the world you were born in uh, moscow yeah. uh similarly i want to ask so you know uh, just being more self aware or uh, following the path of spirituality uh, has it ever happened uh, has it ever helped you in your material success well i've honestly never tried to use it in my business as uh, you know uh by because of virtue of how we were brought up how we are we've never used uh I've never used it as a instrument to succeed or fail or judge anybody else. So, I mean, I if to me, um, my business transactions have been independent of <coughs> the background of the other person. Of course. And I've never tried to leverage the fact. Okay, I am of this community, so I might be able to get success. I've never done that. So, it's honestly speaking, it has uh, it has um, never been a part of any of the. Uh, business dealings or decisions that I have had to, had to take, you know. Um, Absolutely. So that, mm-hmm. uh, but you know what I think. So uh, right now, the uh, like you know the picture of Sikh globally is brilliant because uh, so I was speaking. So we had Mr. Gurpreet Gogi on the podcast as well. We spoke to him how you know how Sikh were uh, pictureized in the movies back in the day. Yeah. Like you know, he shava shava, lassi, butter chicken, all of yeah. that. but now how movies have been evolving and how yeah. they actually understand so uh, he he narrated a story that when he was tying his turban a person like from bombay he was shocked that okay don't you like you know just put it on your head yeah. and he said no like you know there's a f- whole process of tying your turban so he said that you know dheere uh, dheere people are getting uh, more aware of how the sikh communities and i think the farmers protest and uh the like, like uh, uh organizations like khal said they have been helping globally yeah. i think there are first ones to go to syria iraq like all the uh, where wa- war had happened yeah. uh so i think the overall picture of uh, say globally is improving i think a lot of people had a lot of stereotypes and again you know coming back to the I first think, i think uh, i would say that the image of sikhs is what it is not because of uh, i mean it obviously a lot has happened <coughs> in the recent times which is brought six to the limelight yes. but you know the genesis of the religion it was based on uh dekh dekh fate yes right uh, it was based on the fact that you were supposed to serve humanity not only serve in terms of physical service serve in terms of providing security also so you were you were obligated by virtue of your religious teachings of your you know gurus that you need to give back to the society uh and i like the fact that you know it made a very beautiful distinction that 
uh, if you don't have the financial means to do it, you can do it with your time. Of course. Because they, they uh, analyze, they assessed it, and they they understood that time was money. Definitely. So they said that if you don't have, I mean, everybody doesn't have the material wealth to give that I will build a temple over here or that. But even if you spend ten percent of your time serving the society, uh, you're doing great for the. And I'm very proud of this fact that when they talked about helping, it was never meant for one particular community. It was meant for humanity. It was and human could be any person from any community, Definitely. caste or creed. And you see it in the langars. You know, everybody can go and have food, and all of them are at the same level now. Uh, when you went going to the, so I think uh, it was the uh, it was the foresight of those people in those days when who created the religion, which has created an image of Sikhs. I really, really hope and pray that you know the Sikhs are able to understand and keep that image intact as they go forward, because. Uh, many religions we've seen, uh, you know, over a period of time, there's there's a lot of deterioration that comes in. It's happening to every religion. It's not, uh, you know, because we assign, we start uh, using it as a instrument to control people, and Definitely. and when that starts, then there are certain aspects associated with it which bring in uh, elements which are undesirable in a in a spiritual context. Yes. Um, Sikhism is no, you know, you know, it's not uh, devoid of those problems. We yeah. have similar problems. I mean, I've had certain experiences which are absolutely contrary to what Sikhism stands for. Right. I mean, uh, the beauty, the Sikhism, the beauty was the equality. I mean, women and men were held at the same level yes. in Sikhism. The Guru Gobind Singh Ji gave Kaur, which means the princess, the, the, you know, the highest, the most brilliant title to the ladies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if you go to uh, Darbar Sahib now, Golden Temple, there is a Palki Seva which happens when the uh, Babaji's bead goes from Golden Temple, Harbandar Sahib to Akal Takht. It is carried on a palanquin, and the ladies are not allowed to perform that Seva. Now, I have absolutely no idea how that came about, but that's not part of what Sikhism stood for. So, um, so the image which we're talking about, that they have such a grand image, it was very grandly conceived by the gurus. Whether we can maintain that grandiose image as we go forward is something that is a big challenge that we as a Sikh community need to really confront and take it on head on because uh, discrepancies deep tend to seep in, in every, like any of the religion. And we, are, we are a relatively young religion. Yes. So this is a time when all those discrepancies need to be stemmed. And uh, it's good that the Bollywood has you know, gone away from you know, making a funny looking Sardar with a patka, you know, jumping around like a fool yes. to now making movies about more uh, uh, positive aspects of Sikhs. That's a great thing and I, I mean, one can't thank them enough for that. Uh, but they truly were m meant to do that. It was not that they were enacting something they were suppo not supposed to do. They were truly meant to do that. It's unfortunate some of us have forgotten to do it now. But we were obligated by the teachings to do that. And now you see somewhere people, uh, you know, um, they question, you know, Tumari to, it's not your issue, why are you taking up this issue with you, why are you fighting? Because to stand for the weaker is one of the uh, teachings. teachings yeah. So, <laughs> there's a joke that he said, to beach mein padega hi, padega ladai ke. maybe it's just the fact that this is how they are mentally tuned to <laughs> yeah. respond to a situation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a part of culture, I think. It's a, it's a cultural part. It's a aspect that, I, I mean, as a Sikh, I feel very proud. And I honestly, I can tell you that even, I mean, maybe I'm not uh, able to do it to the extent that I would want to do. But if I see, uh, you know, somebody being manipulated or being abused or being, uh, you know, physically harmed by somebody and I can do something, I don't hesitate to stop and do that. I will do it sometime to the annoyance of my uh, family also because it, why do you take chances because it can you know uh, it can have repercussions for you also Definitely. but that's the way we are and I feel no hesitation saying that uh, we're proud of the fact that as a community we are the way we are that's how we are wired yeah that's how we wired and that's true for Punjabis actually yes I mean it's not Sikh only the, the, the way Punjab culture is I mean it was a very it's a very warm inviting giving culture you know everybody I mean, you can walk into a village in Punjab and tell them that I'm hungry, and they'll feed you to your, you know, gills. And that's the way they are. Oh, I have a very interesting story to share. Yeah. Uh, so there's a friend of mine. Uh, no one knows his 
original name because he uses E as his name because he thinks if I have a name, people yeah. would associate with me a culture, with the country. Yeah. So he has been walking from Nepal to India. Yeah. He has gone from like Leh, Ladakh, then uh, like you no, know, uh, then Jammu. Now he so he came to uh, Punjab. Yeah. Now he went to Delhi. Now I think he's in Madhya Pradesh, yeah. right? So when he came to Mohali, he stayed at my place, and we were like you know, just chatting. So he told me that since the time I've come to India, I don't have a challenge to stay or to eat because wherever I go I just ask them where is the nearest Gurudwara yeah. and that's where I stay and that's where I eat well, uh, it's like not at all it's, it's not at all he said it's very difficult to like although there are Gurudwaras in Nepal as well but he so he had walked 7000 kilometers in Nepal and then he came to India I think he, he must have walked like 8-9 thousand kilometers in India as well he said it's like you know very easy for me to walk in uh, India than walk in Nepal because Gurudwara is so no, we, accessible. In my recent uh, uh, engagement with one of the government agencies, we had to travel to uh, Run of Kutch. I remember. Yeah. Yes, and we went to a place called uh, Lakhpat. Lakhpat was a thriving city in many, in uh, 1500, early okay. 1500, a thriving city. It was a, uh, it, the, the Indus used to flow past through it and it was a trading port. Oh, okay. And a lot of trade from uh, Middle East used to come there, and it was a thriving city. It had, uh, you know, rice uh, farming, and everything was up and about. Uh, so Guru Nanak Dev Ji had visited that place in 1506 or seven, and, and during his trip to Makkah Medina, he had gone to Makkah on one of yes. the udasis that he used to travel. So uh, he stayed with a Sindhi friend over there. So cut the long story short, the Sindhi friend made uh, converted his house into a Gurdwara for in honor of Guru Nanak Devi's visit. Many years later in uh, 1816 or 17 there was a massive earthquake in that area and uh, the uh, the Indus changed its course. It went 35 kilometers northwest it moved into what is now Pakistan okay. and the uh, level of the earth uh, of the soil dropped to a point where saline water came in. Oh. So agriculture also vanished the port city died up so entire city got um, like a thriving city of yes. 40 50000 people only 800 900 people were left but that gurdwara still remains there so when we went to lakhpat for this we were doing a trial with one of the organizations and there was no place to stay in that area i mean uh, the uh, the closest hotel was in bhuj which was uh, 3 hours away from that place and we had a team so we went to lakhpat and we saw this Gurdwara, so we went and asked them that uh, we want to stay. By all means, <laughs> uh, they opened the room. They opened the rooms uh, immediately. I mean, the Gurdwara was already functioning, so they prepared lunch, dinner, breakfast. So two days we stayed there. We didn't have to worry about any of the aspects, and uh, they had. I mean, in that complete isolated, small little outpost, they had water for us to bathe. They had place for us to sleep. They had warm food to eat. And uh, then I asked him, I said, listen, you are such a small village of 800 and how many Sikh people do you have? He says, we are only 8 of us. Oh. So I said, who are the others? So there are about 600 Muslims uh, and about 150 Hindu fam Hindus live there. So I said, how do you manage, what, what is, he says, you know, people like you who come here, people they keep donating, we run with that and the local community also helps. So the Muslims, the Hindus were also helping the Gurdwara, the Gurdwara was serving the people who were coming there and even today the only place to stay in Lakhpat if you go there <laughs> is that Gurdwara, there is nothing, nowhere else. So the fact that we found it, I mean otherwise we had no option but to either drive 300, yes. drive 3 hours every day up and down or stay sleep in a tent, here you had this Gurdwara <laughs> over there which is <laughs> unbelievable and similarly we had experience in Dubri also in, uh, in Assam which is in Bangladesh but there is a Gurdwara, Guru Teg Bahadur had visited there, they had made a Gurdwara there. So the fact that these Gurdwaras are different places and they serve the community is a testament to the fact that whatever was taught is still being followed which is a which is a very nice thing. Of course, this reminds me of, a, a, so Khal Said had posted a picture I think it's like two years ago but it's still in my mind uh, about a Gurdwara in Malawi. Okay. in uh, Africa I think mm -hmm. so 
I think that was the post about the origin of Khalsa and how it started. Okay. And they posted like, you know, uh, Malawi had very, very like, not even one percent of the population of Sikh, but uh, like you know, it served as a hub of uh, like you know, feeding a lot of poor people from Malawi. A lot of tourists used to stay in Malawi uh, in in that Gurudwara. So you know, your story just reminded well, me I, of that I, story in Malawi. You, I mean, I, maybe I'll share the photograph of that place with you and. It's it's a beautiful little gurdwara. I mean, uh, later on, obviously, in my it was my ignorance. I didn't know it in, before going there. Uh, it is a heritage site. Wow. Yeah, and uh, it became a heritage site uh, many years ago. In fact, it, technically, I should have known about it, but I didn't. But now that I know, I make I have vowed that I will go more frequently to see that place. It's really really nice place to be. Love the fa- fact how you said. It was my ignorance, and I should have known about it. I, I mean, of course, one should have known. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, n- now coming back to your corporate life, and now your, you know, uh, all the things that you do. Yeah. So, uh, but before we start, if you can tell us what are all the things that you do, because I saw Gecko Motors, I saw a green uh, Infinia Green Inf- Tech. Infinia Green Tech. I, so you are working with the hotel. Uh, you're, you're working with the group that owns the hotel. Uh, you had Iron Scorpion. So, if you can tell us what are all the things that you have been doing. Well, um, as I told you uh, when we were chatting that, you know, uh, I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. Yes. I ended up being electronics and telecommunication one. Uh, because of that, I worked in electronics industry for 22 years in different forms. Uh, basically, I was working for CDL group for all those 22 years except for one year when I went for my MBA to UK. And in different uh, capacities at Deltron, I was looking after business development. Then in CDL, I became part of uh, um, the hospitality and retail operations where we were to buy, uh, to build a hotel and set up retail. Uh, but that desire to be a mechanical engineer was always uh, some, you know, somewhere in my mind. I always wanted to do that. So in um, 2015, I decided to take a plunge and start something where I could spend time doing more of mechanical work. I mean prior to that on weekends I used to work on certain things, I used to uh, um, try and put together some old cars, I, I bought a standard Herald which was a, a Triumph uh, of, uh, of olden day 60s. I repaid it for myself, I drove it for some time. I was I kept that passion alive by doing it on my own. I also saw a 1949 Ford. Yes, 1949 Ford belongs to a friend of mine. Oh, okay. Uh, that he's, he's my closest friend. Okay. I mean, uh, he's my confidant, friend, everything, and uh, he made it. He took it. Uh, he, his grandfather owned that Ford. Oh, wow. His grandfather was in Lucknow. Uh, if I am not correct, he was one. He was a very senior uh, doctor. Um, this, I think the chief uh, surgeon of UP, and he had this Ford in 1949. Wow. He bought it. Uh, from the dealership and after a s- few years of operation I think in 70s they parked it over there and it was lying in a house in Lucknow so one day when he saw me that I am doing something automotive he said I want you to put it back together for me so that car landed up with me that was a bad decision on his part because <laughs> I have spent 4-5 years on it actually now and still it's just about ready to go now after wow. 5 years so he's uh, he's been very patient um, <laughs> and uh, but yeah that Ford belongs to him so when uh, in 2006, uh, 2015 I decided that I start doing something in earnest. So I set up Serblo and uh, uh, before that I had done uh, two projects which were my weekend projects. I had done one for Gulpanag, I had done a car called Super Milo which, is a, which was a modified uh, Scorpio getaway for expeditions which she used extensively and it came in Discovery Turbo also uh, off-roading with Gulpanag, there were episodes on that. So that actually got the ball rolling. Because when people saw that, that you know, something of that, it was a kind of a um, ahead of its time in those days in 2013 uh, 14, nobody was using uh, you know, like things like rooftop tents and built in, uh, um, you know, your cooking gases and mm-hmm. water carrying capacities, communication yeah. device. So yeah. I did something because when you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you're doing something for fun, so over a period of six months, seven months, I, I, I we went all out. It came out quite well and it, it was it generated a lot of interest so people kept calling me then that we want to do something similar. Um, so in uh, 
2015 it became a bit intrusive it started impacting my work i mean i would be sitting in a meeting and i would get a call from somebody and i also started thinking that maybe it's time that i should try something on my own so i was very fortunate that uh, when i spoke to the management of cdl that i want to venture out uh, not only did they kind of uh, uh, allowed me to do that they also kept the association alive uh, by you know uh you know giving me the option yeah, giving me the option of coming here every thursdays yeah. or every day in a once in a week where i can come and <coughs> still be part of the op- hotel operations um looking after the interest uh, other the owners interest and making sure that everything is still uh, running the way it should be running um so that started the infinia green tech private limited because back home mind i wasn't sure about how automotive business will do so i thought let me try and keep my uh, not to let me hedge my risk by trying to also venture into environmental technology you know i was still thinking there is a opportunity for water treatment plants and uh, alternate sources of energy so infinia green tech that's a green came tech. so i thought that would be the name but once serblo serblo was just a brand under infinia green tech okay so i used to run my automotive business under the brand serblo because of what we discussed they were yes. the name um the automotive generated far more interest and far more uh, and so the environmental part of the business kind of took a back seat <laughs> so it was all about uh, uh, off road vehicles extreme off road builds expedition vehicles restoration work and somewhere in between there then i realized that you know um, i wanted to give it a more organized you know structure to the company rather than just being a customized customization shop i wanted to give it a more of a you know industry kind of uh, structure where uh, i thought maybe i should get some technology which will be useful for um, defense ac- applications wow uh, and that's where i approached my friend and now business partner dwayne in us he used to ma- he makes a vehicle in a scorpion range of vehicles which are high mobility vehicles extremely high mobility they've been designed to go over extreme terrain because of the extreme articulation they have a patented suspension technology so uh, we both started a joint venture company called iron scorpion private limited iron scorpion high mobility vehicles private limited hmv and um, we tried to uh, we participated in some several co- couple of competitions in india we also exhibited it at auto expo in 2018 yes, yes. we tried to generate interest but uh, we were i think limited by the fact that as a i was an entrepreneur over here he was entrepreneur over there and the nuances of doing business with government agencies uh, overwhelmed us i'll be very honest so uh, at one stage we decided i you know let's not push ourselves to a point where we exhaust ourselves so we kept that on the back burner and uh, we were thinking of uh, you know when the laws and the you know the uh, structure taxation structures in the country become more progressive we'll probably uh, rekindle this project but in the interim uh, uh quadro international uh, from ukraine uh they kind of uh, they were looking for entering into india so they must have done their research they f- they came about they came to know about me so they approached me the whether i would like to associate with them to bring in their range of vehicles which are sherp amphibious all terrain vehicles i've seen that so um i was toying with this idea and i was speaking to another off roader friend of mine uh, vivek gujral so we you know i was telling him this is what has happened and this is what i am doing and you know i i wasn't very sure about whether i want to do this or not because of my experience with iron scorpion and yeah. but um i think uh we were able to you know he I, when i spoke to him he was able to understand what needs to be done and how we could do it and we then both decided to work on this together so we set up gecko motors uh and gecko motors basically uh took over the iron scorpion operations and that got amalgamated into gecko and gecko now is uh l- is working on providing mobility solutions for various applications sherp is one of them we are also designing and developing a high speed desert vehicle which will be which will allow people to travel at a high speed over desert rather than conventional 30 40 km yeah, per hour we are yeah. targeting to you know average 70 80 km per hour with top speeds of 140 and 50 km per hour so that's what we're working on and uh, so uh, as we went along we had another partner join us uh, from our 
again from our off-road community, uh, uh, Ujjal, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, finest off-road drivers we have in the, in wow. the country. He's two times national champion in JK off-road events. So we are running this company together now, and uh, hopefully, uh, uh, you know what we learned from our experience with Iron Scorpion, we'll be able to, uh, you know, find our way through. Uh, to the to the uh, operational aspects or bureaucratic aspects of doing business in this country. That's the difficult part. Yeah, so I think uh, <coughs> we've had some success so far in terms of how far we progress compared to what we did with Scorpion. Largely because I think uh, being a one-man show earlier and now you know having the support of uh, friends and partners, it's it's always helpful. I want to understand about the creative process because I think. What you are doing doesn't have a lot of precedent, like you know, doesn't have a lot of, uh, uh, like you know, things for where, where you can get some inspiration from. Yeah. There has to be a lot of originality, yeah. right? And like you know, uh, because you told that there's a patent as well, and then you are thinking how you can, uh, you know, increase the top speed in the uh, desert. So this requires a lot of originality of yeah. thoughts, then originality of technology. Yeah. So how does your creative process look like? Like you know, how do you get the because uh, as of now, whatever people speak or whatever people think, there's a good chance that someone out there has already thought of that, right? So, and what you're thinking is a lot of like you know original things that you're coming up with. So, how does your creative process or how does originality of thought for you look like? Well, um, I think it's in my case, it's, it's I think it's evolved over a period of time. I mean, for me, when I started. Uh, working in Serblo, the creativity came from the fact that I looked at the way people were doing conventional off-roading. Okay. I mean, they still took the jeeps with leaf springs and they would go and bounce over rocks and hills and do things forcefully trying to, you know, force their way through an obstacle, which is nice. They were enjoying, they were having fun, there was nothing wrong with that. But I, I was, at the same time, I thought that, you know, if we could do this in a way where a car is capable of doing it, it's been designed to do this. So when I thought about that, obviously then we looked at certain aspects, I mean I read about it, it was not it came naturally to me that you know I suddenly Eureka moment happened, okay I will do this. I, I looked at what people were doing in the other parts of the world, I read about it and I realized that you know there are certain things which we weren't doing at all in India, we were just following same old design for last 40-50 years. So we worked on the suspension designs, we mastered what I believe now, at least I can say that we were the first in this country to introduce a multi-leg front and rear suspension of the kind that we use in extreme off-roading and it set the benchmark for others to follow. But we also like, I mean, typical m management learning that one has, you know, don't sit on your laurels and keep innovating, keep innovating. So every time we used to uh, work on a new car we used to force ourselves to think of something new. I mean, uh, they say that if it's not broke, why fix it? So I said, we cannot follow that routine. If it's not broke, why fix it? There is always a better way to do it. So let's find that better way to do it. Uh, you know, it might have succeeded 10 times and there's always a way to do it that it, you know, succeeds in a better way. So my team used to say, sir, why do we do I said, yeah, if we don't do it, people catch up and Sometimes in between you become complacent and uh, we became complacent oh, in yeah, between, yeah, yeah. I mean I was saying 17, 17, 18 we were leaps and bounds ahead of others, you know, everybody would try and say ki, inki, whatever these guys do we need to copy it. 18, 19 we set on our laurels, we said, yeah, okay, we, and then when we went there to compete in 2018, it was, <laughs> everybody was same, I mean we were no different from them yeah. and the the margins, the we advantage had kind of narrowed down. So then we sat down and said, listen, this is what happened. <laughs> so now we have to uh, innovate again. So we went back to doing something again, trying to do something which is, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's the right way. You can't force innovation, but uh, you can uh, you can attempt innovation by conscious effort, you know, it can't, yes. it, 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 Eureka, moment, Eureka moments don't happen all the time. You have of to course. seek them, I think. I mean, uh, you have to keep experimenting. You're so for me, if we've been doing, if we've been innovating is because I firmly believe that you have to keep changing. If you don't change, 
you will not succeed in in the country where copyrights patents trademarks have absolutely no bearing i mean i'm sorry if i am saying this thing but uh, we spent 3 years 4 years perfecting something uh, you know the angles the material thicknesses the um, weights of the rods the position of the weld and people just copied them i mean how is there's no rocket science to it yeah, you know you yeah. all you need is a inch tape and we just need to measure things and just copy it so once we made our cars within a period of a year two years people were doing the same thing exactly same thing we changed the body profile we started using space frames with aluminum within next year people started using this so there's there is no <coughs> safety net in in our environment so if you don't have safety net the only way you can succeed is to do something new so you keep doing it to a point where even copying becomes difficult so we looked at uh, finding partners overseas sherp came about fact that sherp has such technologies that even if somebody wants to copy it now they can copy it obviously but it will be at a, a huge cost now how many are willing to invest that much money yeah. is something that um, only time will tell but for the moment i think we have a we have we what we believe at least a year or two years head start over the others absolutely i think complacency is generally very dangerous yeah. and uh, again i'm going to make an assumption about you but i, I like you know i could deduce that you are a very curious person you say a lot of what ifs like you know what if we can add this to this what if we can do absolutely. this what if we can do absolutely. this absolutely that's what gives rise to creativity and that's what you know the, i think that's a that's w- that's innovation 101 yeah i mean right. uh, it comes at a cost also i'll tell of you what because uh, i've had instances where we have annoyed our customers because in the need to do something even better than what they expecting we've taken time yes of course i mean they would have expected that the car would be ready in 2 months because we wanted to change the uh, positioning of certain things in the vehicle it has taken 3 and a half months so it obviously annoys them they might get the end product which is better than what we had promised them originally but those 1 and a half 2 months are a uh, very very difficult time for you also because you are going against your uh, you know uh, your natural instinct to just do it give it settle the counts and move on but you are this can be done better i'll do it in a different way i know it's going to annoy my customer but i'm still going to do it uh, you have a risk that it might not go better <laughs> but you want to keep doing but that's that's me i i firmly believe that um i have okay we have made about 55 to 60 extreme competition vehicles and against all management logic they all are different wow okay maybe one or two might be identical but you can say that there have been 45 variants of what we've done not because we wanted to just uh, improve on something no because we wanted to create something which was different from what we did earlier and everybody advises me against it that you're wasting time money effort because you this can be done much faster but in your self imposed desire or so you know your desire of creating something different you keep uh you you know waste time but i've done it so far but it comes at a cost so this time when we you know with gecko motors we are standardizing now okay servlo will remain the way it is but with gecko motors we are standardizing it now we'll have uh what henry ford said you can have any color as long as it is black so <laughs> in our case we are being more generous you can have any color actually but there's the car will remain there's the, the, car, the like car will remain the same but you can change the color you want <laughs> okay. we change we give you whatever color you want but the design the specs will remain the same so it's for you to decide what you want to change it only thing that we'll allow them is maybe uh, the tire tread if they want all terrain or a mud terrain or if they want a red color blue color what car they want those are minor things that we'll allow them to change but other than that the basic form structure will remain the same because i think like I don't want to get into this management thing but again like you know if you wa- if you create standardized products there is a possibility of scaling and all of the like not don't know much about it don't want to get into it uh, but i will ask uh, one question for you and this is not related to this but the, our prior like our first part of the conversation uh, when we were speaking about religion we were when we were speaking about community as well uh, I had this question, but we had already started the second part of the conversation. Yeah. So, because you have travelled abroad, you have lived abroad, uh, you have gone around uh, India so much. What role has 
community and religion played for you in terms of m- maybe making you more comfortable in these countries or making you more uh, proud in the, like what role has it played uh, okay <laughs> Sikh by nature are very proud people huh? I think if you would have known, Sikhs are proud yeah, of course and, so, and I think uh, majority of us I won't say everyone but majority of us are very uh, confident also majority yes. of us yes. so so that helped me being very comfortable wherever I was and I think I cannot do justice by not saying th- this that the army played the most important contributory factor towards what I am today which I feel uh, growing in the Indian army environment <coughs> uh, one is that uh, you become very adaptable I mean okay. if you if you have to change 10 schools in 12 classes you know how to adapt to changing environment so whatever management reaches you that you had you need to change with time and you need to adapt we are taught I'm your guy. Uh, we, 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 we are the gurus in this <laughs> we can teach you we can give you a few lessons in there. Uh, second thing was that uh, there is an innate uh, sense of discipline in the army environment because that's the way they are I mean if there's th- if there's 20 kilometers per hour written on the speed limit on a cantonment you will drive at 20 kilometers per hour not because this policeman standing there because everybody is doing that it's expected of you and moment you come out of cantonment things change altogether so you're living in this country within a country um, so that helped us I'd say be a more responsible citizens you know when we went out I mean I think I don't think I do injustice to India with the way I represent myself outside because I follow the rules I obey the uh, you know I pr- uh, I follow the la- rule of the land wherever I am uh, we are confident because of the fact that we brought up that way um, as far as my religion is concerned uh, because it te- te- it has taught us to treat everybody equally so I've never had issues of you know racism or um, anything for that matter differentiating people when I'm interact with them for me everybody every community caste religion is just about the same so I, I, I don't do it consciously it doesn't it, I just can't differentiate because I'm not taught to do that so when I whenever I travel I mean I approach everything the same way I approach over here so maybe it's, it's your body language it's your um, it's your tone it's your way you uh, respond to situation people also sense the fact that you know he is comfortable so they become more comfortable even when I've had instances of somebody trying to be racist to me you know uh, it happens yes it doesn't bother me at all because uh, <coughs> that's what they are and so I think combination of self pride and discipline from religion and Indian army has helped me I would say that I couldn't have asked for a better combination yeah. I mean uh, some t- people say they, they say they k- sick by birth proud by choice I think I would add to that proud to be uh, in Nami brat you know, because they round you up in a very very great fashion I mean um, if there is I don't carry regrets in life I don't think that one should carry regrets but yes I wish I had joined the army when I had the chance to but that time the corporate world beckoned me and at that green you know the attractions of being <laughs> in the world was always it but I think uh, I'm so very proud of the fact that you know uh, I had a chance to experience army very closely because of my father so yeah that's that's the answer to your question how it helped me yeah. so for me uh, I think uh, Indian army is also a form of a religion which uh, 11 1.1 million people practice actively and there's a large community which is retired but they still practice it beautiful yeah. uh, right so thank you so much and you know I have a lot of questions in my mind and I I thought I'm selfish but I'm not selfish enough to take so much of your time and I cannot contain your wisdom in what 60 minutes of the uh, conversation but thank you so much sir. Well, thank I have, you so I have much. enjoyed this thoroughly and I think <laughs> um, you know it's great because no, it's not very often you get chances to reflect on your own thinking by interacting with you I was actually thinking about all these things that you asked me and you know I'm glad that I spent time uh, analyzing my own self because I hadn't done that for a very long time 
it's an honor to be in the same room with someone like you thank you so you're, thank you you being very kind but thank you for spending time and once again i'm very sorry that we couldn't do it sooner as you know it's been many months since we've been trying to do this uh, now that we've done it i'm glad that we've had a chance to meet and i'm sure we'll be interacting otherwise also there's no way i could have let you go without the podcast so thank you so much for being on the jantak show